Hello, guys. Nice to see you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, so yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. So recalling <clears throat> our previous discussion, I would like to mention that we uh, continued this discussion of the concept of uh, electric field flux and um, Gauss law. And uh, based on uh, Gauss law, we have shown how it's possible to uh, use um, advantages which are provided by Gauss law in order to determine electric field uh, around some continuum electric charges, uh, taking into account certain conditions like symmetry and uh, perpendicular um, or parallel orientation of the uh, normal uh, vector to the surface uh, to, to of Gauss uh, surface to the electric field vector. Uh, so it's possible to um, determine electric field uh, next to this continuum of electric charges in quite a simple and straightforward way. So today we are going to talk um, about conductors in uh, uh, external electric field. Good afternoon. Yeah, nice to see you. And uh, uh, probably before we go specifically to this uh, into this topic, um, I would like to um, have a short discussion with you about uh, types of um, materials in terms of their electrical conductivity. So we will focus more on crystalline materials um, and uh, uh, we'll distinguish um, three main uh, types of materials in respect to their electrical conductivity in order to uh, make it more clear what exactly is a conductor. And then we will place this conductor in electric external electric field and consider certain um, features uh, uh, related to electricity, which are happening uh, to such a conductor in external electric field, assuming that uh, it is in um, equilibrium condition. So there is no uh, charge transport. That we will discuss a bit uh, later. <clears throat> so I believe that most of you guys already joined, have joined us. So let me switch the camera. And the question will be, um, maybe someone from you guys can uh, suggest uh, what type of materials we have in terms of their electrical conductivity, in terms of their ability to uh, conduct uh, electricity. Non-conductors. Non-conductors, so that's good, but they are usually called as uh, insulators. insulators. Okay, so let's have insulators. Then what else? Semiconductors. Oh, semiconductors. That is interesting. By the way, it's, uh, interesting to me since it's actually my field of research. Uh, and uh, also, obviously, we have, if we mentioned that we are going to talk about conductors, so obviously there are conductors. But uh, so we can write here conductors. 
but uh, which type of crystalline conductors you know most common one? What conducts electricity very well? Metals. Metals. So, any ideas? What is fundamentally different between these three types of uh, materials um, in terms of their ability to uh, conduct electricity. So why uh, insulators do not conduct electricity and metals conduct? Okay, we have a question. Yeah, Beck, you are welcome. Oh, uh, that wasn't a question. I mean, you you asking about you asking students about uh, what's the difference between these things. Yes, yes, you are right. So uh, yes, there is main difference is overlapping of uh, valence band and uh, conducting band. Okay, that's good. Electron. True. So let make it a bit more generalized. So uh, obviously that in solid state uh, crystalline materials, uh, electric charge can be conducted by mobile electrons. So we're not talking about some liquid um, like electrolytes where there are some ions like ionized atoms. So there could be also some positive uh, charges which can uh, positive ions which can conduct uh, electric charge <clears throat> through the medium. In crystalline solids, electric charge is conducted by electrons. Um, so electrons in free space they can occupy any energy uh, because they it depends on sorry. It depends on the uh, their previous conditions, how much they were accelerated, and so on. Um, however, in crystalline materials, um, they can occupy only certain energy levels, and uh, this allowed so-called allowed energy levels where electrons can be, they form um, some uh, so-called like bands, when we put many atoms together, um, the um, allowed energy levels form, form bands. And uh, the most important in terms of electrical properties of materials are, as you mentioned uh, previously, uh, valence and um, conduction band. So if we show here E, V, that is top of valence band, and this will be EC, the bottom of the conduction band. So we have energy levels down here. They can be filled by uh, electrons and energy levels up here. So they can also be filled by electrons. So there is a gap between the top and bottom of valence and conduction band, respectively. And this is called as band gap, energy gap, EG. So at room temperature, so we are talking about conductivities at room temperature, so which is something like 25 degrees Celsius. At room temperature, um, energy of electrons, which are in the valence band, is not enough to be thermally excited and uh, occupy energy level in the conduction band. So why it happening? Because EG is very large for insulators. So usually it is larger or equal to three electron volts. So this, gap is very large. That's why at room temperature, 
excitation, thermal excitation is not enough. Um, electrons cannot go to the um, conduction band. And if we have some electron in conduction band, it is not bound to its atom. So it can move all over the space of this crystalline uh, material. Means it can uh, participate in charge transport. However, uh, for uh, insulators with large energy gap, like band gap between valence and conduction band, this is um, very difficult to realize and concentration of electrons in conduction band is um, negligibly small. So that's why they do not conduct electricity. With metals, if we have we also have, it's also crystalline uh, solid uh, material, and it has uh, valence and conduction bands. However, the thing is that these guys kind of overlap. So we can have here EC and uh, conduction band, and here will be EV that is valence band, means that these guys overlap and uh, uh, at any temperature, even much lower temperatures than room temperature, we will have um, plenty of electrons which are in the conduction band and uh, will, be, uh, part will participate in uh, charge transport. So there is really a huge concentration of free electrons in metals, so they uh, can easily move all over the volume of this material and uh, participate in charge transport. So that is the key reason why uh, we have insulators and uh, conductors, which are the most um, important representatives of conductors uh, metals. However, in this case of, of uh, semiconductors, um, obviously we have something in between. So we have conduction band and valence band. The, uh, from first look, it looks very similar to the insulator band structure. However, because we do have band gap, e.g., uh, however, this band gap is smaller than uh, that for insulators. So if it is smaller than three electron volts um, and can come up to like 0.01 electron volt, it can be very narrow band gap material. Um, it is easier to excite electrons from valence band, uh, populate uh, energy levels uh, in the conduction band, and uh, let them participate in charge transport. So uh, just focusing our attention on the band diagram of this uh, most common uh, three types of materials, we can um, explain the difference in their behavior in terms of uh, conductivity of electric charge. So having this general introduction of insulators, semiconductors, and conductors, uh, we can uh, make um, a step further and consider what will happen if we have a conductor in some piece of metal. Um, generally saying um, when we place it in external electric field. So let us go to another slide and consider um, four the most important statements which we should know about um, uh, conductors in uh, external electric field under electrostatic equilibrium when we don't have any uh, charge transport. So first of all, 
that is the most important uh, electric field anywhere inside the uh, conductor should be equal to zero. So we will discuss all of these uh, statements and then uh, we will try to explain the uh, reasons for them like, and their uh, physical background. So the second statement is that uh, if such a conductor, which is placed um, in external electric field or just uh, stays in electrostatic equilibrium uh, is charged, then this electric charge, which is uh, on the uh, conductor, should reside only on its surface. So it should be only on the surface and not inside the um, uh, conductor. So the third statement, that the electric field at a point just outside the charged conductor surface uh, will be perpendicular to this surface, according to this uh, electrostatic equilibrium, and uh, its magnitude will be uh, proportional uh, to uh, sigma divided by epsilon naught, which is uh, sigma, we discussed it uh, previously, is the surface density of electric uh, charge on the surface of this conductor. And uh, the fourth one, the surface charge density is uh, greater at uh, locations where radius of uh, the uh, curvature of this surface um, is smallest. Uh, so um, we will discuss this point, the fourth one, a bit later because it involves um, consideration of such concept as electrostatic potential. Uh, we will introduce it later. Uh, but first three, uh, which we mentioned, uh, we need to explain and understand what stands in terms of physics uh, concepts behind these statements. So start from the first one, which states that internal electric field is um, equal to zero inside a conductor under this electrostatic equilibrium condition. Uh, from definition, electrostatic equilibrium means that charges do not move because there is uh, equilibrium and they don't move, they stay in one place. There is no force which can uh, move these charges. So if we assume that internal electric field inside this conductor is not equal to zero, then there will be some electric force acting on our charges inside the conductor. So it will be Q electric charge times this internal electric force, uh, internal electric field vector. And that will mean that uh, these charges upon experiencing this, uh, upon the act of the um, electric force, will start to move with some acceleration. We can write the acceleration, that's according to uh, second law of motion, electric field vector divided by mass of the charge, we can consider mass of electron. And it will be Q times E internal divided by mass of electron. So um, taking into account that, uh, like our initial statement that the conductors is under electrostatic equilibrium, charges do not move with any acceleration there. There are no uh, some external, uh, some forces which uh, force them to uh, move with acceleration uh, in certain direction. 
And that means that internal electric field just cannot be equal to anything else but zero. <clears throat> so the question is, how is it possible to realize this? Because uh, we are talking about some um, conductor. Let's consider some piece of metal uh, in external electric field. In order to uh, achieve this condition that external that electric field inside the um, conductor is equal to zero, there should happen some um, process which is called polarization. So, uh, mobile, let's say if it's metal and mobile electrons will uh, accumulate at the left side of this plate and not compensated positively charged uh, uh, atoms of metal, which are fixed in crystalline lattice, they will um, have some dominant uh, positive electric charge next to the right side of the uh, metal plate. Uh, we know that electric field vector is oriented from positive charge to negative charge. So there will be some uh, internal uh, electric field, which is uh, oriented in opposite to external. And this polarization will happen until that moment when uh, this induced electric field I will compensate external electric field uh, until uh, they equal to each other and uh, fully compensate each other. So uh, eventually we will have only uh, inside this conductor condition that electric field will be equal to zero, means there will be no electric uh, force acting on uh, electric charges. <clears throat> so that's the mechanism how this zero electric field condition in um, a conductor under electrostatic equilibrium placed in external electric field can be reached. So now uh, we also uh, need to discuss the second statement, which tells us that the uh, electric charges, if we charge a conductor under electrostatic equilibrium condition, um, this excessive electric charge will reside only on its surface. So in order to prove this, let us consider some arbitrary shape uh, conductor. And then just very close to the surface, we will consider this closed Gauss surface. We know that electric field inside the conductor under electrostatic equilibrium is equal to zero, means that at each point of this Gauss surface located inside the conductor, but very close to the surface, uh, at each point of this uh, closed surface, uh, electric field vector is equal to zero, means according to the uh, previous discussions of electric field uh, flux, electric field flux will be also equal to zero. If there is no electric field, no electric field flux through this uh, surface. If electric field flux is equal to zero, and we remember that according to 
uh, Gauss law, electric field flux is equal to charge divided by epsilon uh, zero. Uh, charge which is enclosed in this um, Gauss surface. Uh, if it's equal to zero means numerator of this expression is also equal to zero. So electric charge inside this Gauss surface will be equal to zero. And that means that if we accumulate, like, like if we charge some conductor, like provide some um, electric charges um, to a conductor, these charges can, depends what we provide either positive or negative charges. Uh, let's say we charge it negatively. So these charges can uh, be located only on the surface of the conductor uh, <clears throat> and cannot penetrate in the bulk of the conductor. So now let's come to the uh, third statement, which was uh, about the magnitude of electric uh, field vector next to the surface of a charged conductor. So it states that this uh, electric field vector is perpendicular to the um, surface in a given point, and uh, its magnitude is equal to uh, sigma divided by epsilon naught. So this one. Uh, <clears throat> in order to show this, let us go to another slide. So let's assume that we have some positively charged conductor. And we know already that these positive charges can uh, reside only on the surface of this conductor. And then we pick up some mm, surface element of the conductor and draw this Gauss surface in the form of cylinder part of the cylinder will be <clears throat> outside of the conductor and another part will be inside the conductor. So <clears throat> in this case, uh, electric field uh, vector will be perpendicular to the surface of the uh, conductor, means it will be uh, parallel to the normal vector to the side, let's call it A one of the cylinder. So this will be side A2, and this side will be A3. So from um, the similar situation, which we considered in previous discussion, uh, electric field flux through this uh, closed surface represented by a um, cylinder uh, can be represented as a sum of electric field fluxes through surfaces A1, A2, and A3. So electric field flux through surface A2 will be uh, equal to zero because of orientation of electric field vector and its normal vector, they are perpendicular to each other. Now, what do you think about 
electric field flux through surface A1 and surface A3. So let's start from A1. Any suggestions? It seems uncharged. Uh, so flux will be zero. Wait, wait, wait. So we have a positively charged uh, a conductor and these positive charges are residing on the surface of the conductor. Then we have a Gauss surface in the form of cylinder, which is partially immersed in the conductor and partially stays outside. Means that there is some uh, cross section of this cylinder, which overlaps with the surface of the conductor here. And if there is some uh, positive charge distributed on the conductor means on this surface, this cross section between surface of the conductor and cylinders, uh, we will have some surface density sigma uh, of electric charge. Uh, then there will be total charge enclosed by this uh, cylinder equal to sigma times uh, a area of this cross section, which actually will be equal to um, area of the base of the cylinder, A1 and A3. So there is some positive charge, sigma times A, enclosed by this cylinder. Um, means if we have some charge enclosed in a uh, surface, closed surface, uh, there should be some uh, flux of electric field. And uh, in this case, if we consider surface A1, vectors of electric field vector and normal vector to the surface A1, they are parallel, means that electric field flux will be E, magnitude of electric field, times area of the base of this cylinder. We can put just A. <clears throat> so that is electric field flux through surface A1. Now the question will be, uh, so we know, we mentioned already that electric field flux through the surface A2 is equal to zero because of its orientation. But what about surface A3? Any suggestions regarding this question? Negative flux of A1. Uh, so if we come back to our previous discussion, when we were dealing with uh, electrically charged plate, then we had positive electric field flux through surface A1 and positive electric field flux through surface A3 uh, in this configuration. Uh, because we had electric field from the left, left side and from the right side of the plate. However, here we are dealing with a bulk uh, conductor in external electric field um, under electrostatic equilibrium. Previously, today, we have already shown that there is no electric charge when we charge it, uh, such a conductor. All charge is accumulated only, residing only on the surface of the conductor, means there is there are no charges inside the conductor. And there is no electric field inside the conductor. If there is no electric field, if electric field is equal to zero, means electric flux through surface A3 
is also equal to zero. So if E equal to zero, then um, there is no electric flux because there is no electric field. So according to this discussion and uh, conditions, uh, the total electric field flux through this cylindric Gauss surface, electric field flux is equal to E times A. Now, if we uh, recall that uh, according to Gauss law, um, this will be equal to charge, which is enclosed in this cylindric surface divided by epsilon naught, and charge enclosed in this surface, we already discussed it, is given by sigma times A. That will be sigma um, surface density of electric charge residing on the surface of this conductor. In this case, it's positive electric charge times area of the cross section of the cylinder divided by epsilon naught. So we can cancel out uh, A, and we see that the magnitude of electric field next to the surface of a uh, charged conductor under electrostatic equilibrium is equal to sigma divided by epsilon naught, which is uh, a improvement of our previously made statement under number three. <clears throat> What is interesting that here, uh, this equation is very similar to that one which we derived for a um, large charged plane. So we got electric field equal to sigma divided by two epsilon naught. So uh, it is just twice larger then electric field magnitude next to a uh, plate. Uh, <clears throat> and that is because we deal here with a bulk uh, conductor and uh, inside of this conductor, there is no electric field. That's why uh, we have a twice larger electric field next to the surface of the conductor in the space next to it outside the conductor. So with this, we uh, summarize. And uh, uh, during this discussion, we introduced the, uh, the way how we can distinguish between three main types of materials in terms of their abilities to conduct electricity. So we can distinguish between uh, insulators, semiconductors, and uh, conductors. Uh, this feature of conducting electricity is defined by the band structure uh, according to quantum mechanic uh, properties of crystalline solids. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular for conductance, they always conduct, can conduct electricity because of overlapping conduction and valence uh, bands. There is no forbidden uh, uh, band of energies, um, like band of forbidden energies, so-called band gap between the conduction and valence band. So um, also we discuss the behavior of a conductor under electrostatic conditions. We have shown that there is no electric field inside a conductor under electrostatic conditions. There are no charges inside a conductor and all, if we charge a conductor um, and it stays under electrostatic conditions, all uh, charges reside only on the surface of such conductor. And the magnitude of electric field vector next to the surface of a conductor under, like charged conductor under electrostatic conditions uh, will uh, be given by this equation means it is proportional to uh, 
sigma surface density of electric charge like residing on the surface of the conductor uh, divided by epsilon naught, which is twice larger than electric field uh, next to a charged plate. <clears throat> and that difference comes because of the um, difference in uh, bulk and two-dimensional uh, structure of a uh, plate. So we here we deal with a bulk conductor and uh, need to take into account the fact that there is no electric field inside the bulk of um, this conductor. All electric field is only in the space outside the conductor. Okay, guys, if you have any questions, you're welcome. We will continue further with introduction of electric potential, electrostatic potential. Um, and also uh, that will be tightly connected to the work done by electric field. Um, and uh, that will be our topic for next um, discussion, which will be on Monday. So I wish you a good weekend. Take care and see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you for Bye. the lecture. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Have a nice Thank weekend. you. Goodbye. You're welcome. Bye.